want to say, my broker is responsible. Yeah. What do you do about trade compliance? Oh, my broker handles everything. No, you have a responsibility too. Welcome to Simply Trade, brought to you by Global Training Center. My name is Lalo, and together with my co-host, Andy, we have well over 60 years of combined trade, logistics, and supply chain experience. Along the way, we have seen and witnessed different challenges in trade compliance. We decided to put the show together and call on our friends and colleagues in the business to hang out with us and share their knowledge in all things trade. Thank you for spending some time with us. Enjoy the show. Hello again. We uh, are continuing our discussion with Adrian Braumiller. She uh, is uh, giving horror stories, if you will, of uh, things that did not go well in a uh, transaction, whether it was uh, export or import or, and all that. But this will be part two of a really good discussion here. And uh, she's got some more stories to tell us. But if you haven't uh, heard part one, you need to go back and take a look at it right. as we go into part two. Right. So let's just do that. If you haven't uh, heard part one, just hit go back to that first episode because um, – some of this may flow into the uh, uh, with references from the first show. So go ahead and uh, do that, and uh, um, let's bring Adrian back on. All right. Well, I can tell you that personally I've been involved in some uh, M&A activities, and when it's early on, there's such a – it's almost like a top-secret type project because – you know, especially if you're a publicly uh, traded company, that you've got to make sure things don't get disclosed uh, to the public early and all that. Saying that, it's when, so uh, here's where I'm going with this, is again, I, I come back to the leadership of uh, companies. When you're looking at a company to buy, or you are a company that you're maybe uh, acquired and, and, you know, bought, it is paramount that in the very early days in the M&A negotiations that you better have some trade folks involved and your, your compliance folks involved um, and, you know, in the uh, M&A team. And then they have the, you know, sub subsequent tier two type teams that go in and say, okay, we're going to go start doing uh, the investigation, if you will, and research, if you will, in certain areas and, They'll do forensic auditing, uh, uh, accounting, and um, same thing with uh, the purchasing, the sourcing. There are people that need to check all that out when you're buying a company. If you are selling your company, get yourself ready for all that because you need to disclose it. And if you do, it makes the whole situation clean. But if it doesn't, I have seen where some very prominent long-time tenured employees, including uh, the general counsel of uh, some big corporations, that at the end, the acquisition went through, but they wound up losing their job because of the um, problems that were discovered after the fact. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've seen uh, too many cases where uh, we've actually been brought in after the the acquisition or, you know, right before closing, but they're still planning on closing regardless of what we do. Oh yeah. Or, and they want you to, well, just hurry up and do your thing. Right. Right. Yeah. And you know, that's the wrong time to do it. That yeah. is the wrong time to do it. Um, and well, that's of, what I call being the proverbial uh, pooper scooper at the end of a parade. It's like, they want you to come in at the last moment just sign off on it, or if there's a problem, just clean it up real quick. And then, you know, it's like, I'm sorry, but it doesn't work that way. Oh, yeah. So Absolutely. And there's a there's a universal theme that we've had also with our shows, Adrian, where um, the trade compliance person that's in charge is kind of like left out of the, the whole corporate decision making. Absolutely. So, yeah. So this kind of aligns with that, you know, also yeah. when you're doing a merger and acquisition, I mean, you you can't just ignore trade compliance. I mean, of course, we like to say that we're we're preaching to acquire here, but at the same time, um, it's true, you know, and y your story just proved it. And, and almost like I said, that universal theme of the actual individual who feels kind of left out in that decision-making process. Right. Um, 
it, it, within their company, you know, not even in a M and A, but but in this case, now that you're talking about an M and A, it's it's kind of goes hand in hand with that, you know. Yeah, well, and I can tell you that I don't think there are people intentionally with malice. Oh, yeah. Trying to avoid the right. compliance. They just don't think about it initially. Yeah, They're right. so busy on looking at, you know, is this a, str- a good strategic move from a marketing perspective, from a right. operations perspective, the money involved in this and all that. And there's no question that there are legal departments and legal groups that are involved in that. What's surprising to me, though, is that even those attorneys that are involved in that never give think- thought to – you know, the compliance side of things, you know, they'll look at labor law, they'll look at um, taxes, uh, they'll, they'll look at all those different things. And it's like, hey, guys, you're missing a big thing that you sometimes it sinks the deal. It's like, you know what, we just uncovered something. Um, either that $50 million price can be lowered and you, you guys take care of it or, you know, whatever the case may be, we'll buy you for $50 million, but you get before you do, we do, you're going to have to pay that $5 million in duty. Right. And I think, I think you know, even um, uh, the converse is true where you, I've had a couple of really large companies who, I mean, these are Fortune 500 companies and they, received an audit notice and instead of having a, a highly trained uh, trade compliance professional or even they don't have a department and they don't have a person who knows anything about trade. So they'll have, you know, non subject matter experts or they'll have someone in, for example, a traffic or logistics department try to handle the, the, the audit. This has happened in, in a couple of situations. And, you know, those audits went south. They went, they went south. And in one case, you know, it ended up triggering an investigation when really I don't think the facts warranted any type of investigation. But because if you put people in front of customs who don't understand the customs regulations and the trade lingo that customs is used to hearing, right? It's a problem. So like if customs said, you know, to uh, a company during some kind of meeting, you know, what is your basis of appraisement? How do you value your goods? And, And the company replies transfer price. Well, that's not a basis of appraisement, okay? That's a transaction. Yeah, like, so yeah. If you're, they're looking for is a transaction value, is a computed value, you know, the, yeah. the yes. methods of appraisement, they're not looking for right. transfer price. What do you mean by that? <laughs> right? So I think, you know, that's, that's also the point is that, you know, if you're a large company and you don't have people who know what they're doing, that are, if you don't have a trade compliance department, that can get you in a lot of hot water. Wow, that is that's a big one on the M and A side of things, and and as you start looking at it, again from the executive side of things, if you've got some uh, possible mergers that are, um, you know, being considered, you ought to take a look and say, pull in your compliance related person, and say, what's your opinion of this? Uh, you don't even have to say you've got a merger. It's like, what's your opinion of this particular company? Uh, or can you find out anything on it? Is it a good company or is it kind of shady or what's the deal? And it'd be interesting to come back with some, uh, what, what research they get. Oh, and absolutely. Of course you can do, do that with a customs, uh, attorney firm too. So. Yes, you can. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gee, I just happened to know a good one. <laughs> I know, I know, I know yeah, a good redheaded sure. one out of Dallas. <laughs> yes, yeah, sure. there you go. <laughs> oh, I um, love it. I'm trying to think of, oh, I have one more that's foreign trade zone. You want that one? Yeah. Oh, you easy. know what? I may have a good one for you, too, but go ahead. Okay. Well, so in this one case, um, so the company had a customs broker operating the foreign trade zone for the company. And the okay. director of compliance received, and he was relatively new, he received a 
fourteen million dollar pre penalty notice. And basically, it's they were For the what? government said, um, you've got a situation where goods are not showing on the weekly estimate, the thirty four sixty one, um, and so, but you've got different or additional products on the 7501. So because of that delta between, you know, the permission to remove merchandise on the 3461, and you've got a bunch of things declared on the 7501, it's considered smuggling. Um, and so uh, that in that case, the importer of record was uh, forced to file either uh, daily live entries and pay duty or okay. they had to pay duty on everything that was in the foreign trade zone and deactivate the zone. Um, so what we did in that case is, uh, this is kind of funny. So I, I, I said, let's see how large the foreign trade zone bond is. Guess what? There was no foreign trade zone bond. The importer really? Didn't, yeah, the importer didn't have one. Um, and so... We submitted an offer in compromise, and I offered them fifteen thousand dollars. <laughs> because there was no, I was like, "Hey, you're not covered customs. There's no foreign trade zone bond. Here's fifteen k. Will you take that?" Um, we were able to work it out. Customs did accept the the offer in compromise um, based on our promise to put in place, you know, better procedures and. Uh, broker oversight and broker management because really in this case the comp the failure that the company had is that they relied too much on their customs broker to manage their compliance program and you really can't delegate that you know a lot of people want to say my broker is responsible yeah, what do you do about trade compliance oh my broker handles everything no you have a responsibility too so that's well, and you need to know, and that's why some of the things that we're looking at in these shows, it's we're wanting to empower, especially upper management, with uh -huh. the knowledge and and the questions that they should be asking their staff. Right. Doesn't mean you have to become an expert in this. Yes, you have people that you may outsource to, but you better have enough knowledge to realize that if it goes wrong. It's coming, you know, on around your neck. There's where this will be hung. So right, agreed, uh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, and the foreign trade zone, especially if you're operating, uh, you have a third party logistics, a three PL or a four PL in this, would be a, an agent sub agent scenario. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain things that you've got to comply with in running an FTZ with your annual reports and, uh, and the, you know, those estimates and the audits thereof, if there is a significant difference yes. of what you're filing on your 3461s versus the 7501 summary uh -huh. at the end of the week, uh, then you have to get in there and you need to be looking at that going, why is there such a big difference? Yeah. Customs understands there's going to be problems. There may have been new orders that came in that just hit them out as like, okay, at least you can account for it, but you don't right. want to do that week after week after week. Right, exactly. So. Yeah. I, yeah, and I know I've, I've had uh, customers where they are clients where they had um, software glitches where mm -hmm. the software would cause some kind of discrepancy on the 7501 as well, where they had actually withdrawn from the zone a whole lot more than they ever declared on the 7501. So there's a lot of things that can happen, you know, in a foreign trade zone environment. And, and it's important to really make sure you have uh, excellent um, software and as well as uh, partners who are working with you to kind of do uh, health checks on your foreign trade zone operation to make sure that you discover the discrepancies before customs does. Well, I wound up, I, let, let me give you one that I think and see what you think about this is that with a, uh, the operation of an FTZ, they were a third party logistics entity that was dealing with it. Well, their client had a parts database listing and that file would come over. And in that listing would be, you know, like the part numbers and the description 
country of origin, and then also the value of right. that product. Okay. Mm -hmm. Early on, <clears throat> during the um, formation of the FTZ and the application process and all that, the value down to the part number level was not available initially. They were working on it. So what they wound up doing is um, they said, and, and for whatever reason, instead of leaving that value uh, field uh, blank, they said they couldn't do that. So they put in ninety nine ninety nine you know, nine hundred and ninety nine thousand nine hundred and ninety nine dollars right. and ninety nine cents. Okay. <laughs> mm. Supposedly that all got purged out. Guess right. what? There was an entry that went through with that part number. And it wasn't like it was right off the bat. It was like, you know, six, seven, eight, nine months later, you know, all of a sudden that part number came up on a customer order guess what the value had never been updated so here's this exorbitant mm -hmm. value oh, Lord. it went through was transmitted now right off the bat i'm going to tell you the checks and balances any entry and this is something from your compliance side whether it's an ftz whether you're a custom broker whatever if you've got an entry that goes forward with a, an exorbitant value it needs a second or third level check just to make sure is it accurate or what's going right. on. Right, right, right. That this particular entry wound up with one and a half million dollars in duties oh, assessed wow. on it. Okay, <laughs> it actually made it through on that. Apparently, an entry summary was filed, and it hit the statement. And there was a very small window to try and get that corrected. Finally, it did get corrected at the last moment because I said, well, first off, you know, get that deleted off the statement, back it out, and, and see what you can do with it. Fortunately, all that did get uh, uh, corrected. But it was like, uh, you know, the software had to be, uh, the software vendors had to be involved in that because oh, sure. it had already gone past all the checks and balances right. and people let it go. Well, if you're understaffed, that's a good example of making sure you got plenty of people that are involved. You don't have to look at everything, but if it's over five, ten grand, five, you know, fifty thousand, whatever the case is, right, and right. the duties are assessed, boy, you better get a management or somebody to give an extra look on that and say, Yeah, this is valid. Sure, absolutely. Agreed. So. <laughs> Well, Adrian, hopefully you might have had uh, some time to think about this, but uh, we, we like to wrap up with a uh, quick uh, trade gem. I think that's what the, the term we're, we might end up using, but anyway, a trade gem where it's a quick uh, maybe one minute or so um, piece of advice or um, whatever, you know, even a hack, you know, that you might think of that, that might help someone uh, in about a minute or so. Um, you have something like that that you might sure. want to share with the audience? I think, I, I think the one thing I, I think is the most helpful um, is for companies to make sure that they have an ACE, uh, an ACE account and that yep. if they're an importer or exporter or both, that they're regularly monitoring their, their ACE reports and the data that they see there because, you know, a lot of times people will say we don't do X or we don't or we do do Y. And then I'll say, but what does the ACE data show? And we'll look at it, and a lot of times the ACE data, which is the reporting to, to the government, will show something completely different from what they thought they were reporting to the government. So I think from my vantage point, doing a, an ACE data review periodically to make sure that the classifications are right, to make sure that the, the customs brokers that you've empowered to file entries on your behalf or freight forwarders on uh, filing export shipments, that those are parties that you're really doing business with, right? Um, mm -hmm. you, you'd be surprised at how many things you find in the, in the ACE data that you weren't aware of previously. And, and oftentimes it's very different from what you thought. So for me, I think that's a critical thing that, that any, um, good importer or exporter would do if they want to be highly compliant. I would take it to say that is an, first off, that is a great, um, right. Suggestion. Secondly, I would say 
make sure not only do you have an ACE account, but you have your staff, somebody in your staff that is that becomes proficient in accessing that the uh, ACE system and running the appropriate reports uh, in there, and not just occasionally themselves. They they need to become an expert in that. But it's there's so often I've seen situations where items could come across the border and uh, you know truck border, the southern border, whatever, and you'd be amazed on how many. Um, ITs or bonded freight movements are tied to a particular, you know, importer of records uh, bond, if you will, and, right. or you know, mm-hmm. somebody's cutting in it, and it may be a broker. Somebody's done one thing, and then all of a sudden, that, that broker uh, on the borders, it was a one-time shop uh, shipment, and then they're continuing to to use it or something. It's just that's that's a good one. That's a good one there. That know what you've got going in Ace. Know it. Yeah, the data doesn't normally lie. That's the thing is, every now and then, you can find some differences between your documents and ACE data. It's very rare. So I just Mm -hmm. tell people, look, the data doesn't lie. You may think one thing, but this is the data. And if there's an error, okay, fine. Then at least you know about it so you can get it fixed. But if you let it sit there, you own it. Exactly. Agreed. Mm Mm-hmm. Adrian, you are so wonderful. I hope we get to do some more of these with you. Okay, I want to. That sounds like fun. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, there you go. All righty. Thanks, guys. Hey, and before we go, let me just, I'm going to jump in here on something again, is that, folks, um, we're we're offering all these uh, podcasts for free, but I I want you to understand something that uh, you need to, get you and or your staff up to speed on certain subjects and one of the most cost effective ways is the uh, global training center take the time to go in and look at the global training center and just review the the topics and you know hopefully you can see some things that you need to do i would like to ask just try one course just one course and you can see if you like it or and there's more that you can do Thank you very much for joining us. Simply Trade is brought to you by the generous contributions of Global Training Center. You can follow the show and GTC on LinkedIn or Twitter and other social networks. Make sure you check out the show notes in the description for a full rundown of today's show with all the important links. Also, make sure that you share this with a friend and subscribe on your favorite streaming platform. We really like hearing from you. If you enjoyed the show, make sure to rate and review wherever you listen to this podcast. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest in the show or would like to sponsor Simply Trade or suggest any topic you would like for us to discuss, please contact us via email at simplytrade at globaltrainingcenter.com or you can DM us on Twitter at simplytradepod. Thank you again for the privilege of your time. Happy trading. Simply Trade is not a law firm or an advisor. The topics and discussions conducted by Simply Trade hosts and guests should not be considered and is not intended to substitute legal advice. You should seek appropriate counsel for your own situation. These conversations and information are directed towards listeners in the United States for informational, educational, and entertainment purposes only and should not be substituted for legal advice. No listener or viewer of this podcast should act or refrain from acting on the basis of information on this podcast without first seeking legal advice from counsel. Information on this podcast may not be up to date depending on the time of publishing and the time of viewership. The content of this posting is provided as is. No representations are made that the content is error-free. The views expressed in or through this podcast are those of the individual speakers, not those of their respective employers or Global Training Center as a whole. All liability with respect to actions taken or not taken based on the contents of this podcast are hereby expressly disclaimed.